really, where do I begin? Um, yesterday, someone I was talking to said, drink plenty of water. Uh, it helps the neurons and the dendrites, keeps you fresh. I didn't stay around long enough to find out what happens if you drink so much water that you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I never bothered to answer that question. As I said, I've been a part of these, this proceeding for a number of years, and uh, especially in the last several years, in the lead up to this, I've sat there at this moment, looking forward and saying to myself, I can never do this, um, but here it is. So, with that said, again, Chief Judge Bill, members of the judiciary, past presidents, members of the bar, family and friends. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Patrick, I'm gonna make this. My name is John Patrick Charles Cadet. And I, I've just become the 119th president of the Maryland State Bar Association. I didn't think it would start that early, really. <laughs> um, somewhere this morning you heard that this is the 117th annual meeting. Uh, our association historian and all-around trivia guru, Paul Carlin, informed me uh, that, that the, the, the difference between, obviously, 117 and 119 presidents is that two presidents died in office. Accordingly, my first initiative will be to not be the third president. <laughs> I am truly humbled by this honor. I've heard many people say privileged and honored and humbled, and I'm standing here today and I feel so overwhelmed and I feel so humbled by what it is that I'm doing here today. This is the greatest professional achievement of my 60-year-old life. Ever since my nomination over a year ago, and especially in the days and the weeks leading up to this morning, as I'm sure many of the past presidents have done, I have found myself immersed in self-reflection. I have found myself asking questions like, who am I? How did I get to this moment and place in my life? And do I have what it takes to lead this association of nearly 25,000 lawyers? In order to answer those questions, I found it useful to look back at my life and to trace my origins. My origins go back to the first days of the 20th century and two people. Charles Irish and Lee Cadell, my parents. With your permission, I'd like to share their story with you. I believe that you honor your father and your mother by not only obeying what they say while they are alive, but you also do it by telling their story and keeping their memory alive after they've gone. So with that in mind, and in the immortal words of Monty Python, <laughs> and now for something completely different. My dad, Charles Leo Cadell, was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania on June 8, 1908. He was the son of a steel worker. He enlisted in the Army in the 1930s not to see the world, but to try to make a life for himself. He rose to the rank of Master Sergeant and was a gunner assigned to protect the island of Corregidor in the Philippines. It was there in 1940 in the city of Manila that Irish met Leonora. My mom was born Leonora de la Cruz on February 22, 1914. She was one of eight children. My mom met my dad in a club where the GIs went to drink and relax, and according to my mom, it was love at first sight for both of them. Less than a year later, on my dad's birthday, June 8, 1941, they were married. Unfortunately, the honeymoon was short-lived because on December 7, 1941, the day President Roosevelt said would live in infamy, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and plunged my mom, dad, and the world into war. 
In the early part of 1942, the Japanese began a campaign to invade the Philippines. 14,000 Allied troops defended Corregidor and held out against intense Japanese bombardment from December 1941 until May 6, 1942. Food, water, and ammunition had dropped to critical levels when the Japanese finally secured a beachhead on the island on May 5th and landed tanks. My dad and the remaining survivors of Corregidor and Bataan became prisoners of war. What took place in the days following the surrender is still regarded today as one of the most barbaric and inhumane acts of torture that any human could ever inflict on another human being. My dad, along with 75,000 other American, Australian, British, and Filipino prisoners of war, were forced to march from their places of capture, a distance of 80 miles, in what would later become known as the Bataan Death March. My mom also suffered greatly at the hands of the Japanese during the war. The Japanese routinely came to her house, threatening to kill her with a bayonet pushed to her stomach if she didn't tell them who her American husband was and where he was located. As a result of her belief that the Japanese were superstitious and would not desecrate a religious artifact, she took her marriage certificate and my father's military papers and sewed them into the lining of clothing that adorned figurines of the Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and Jesus that she had in her home. The Japanese never found the papers. My father survived the death march and was packed on a train and sent to Shenyang in Manchuria at a prison camp called Mukden Hoten. He remained a prisoner of war in Manchuria for three years and four months until he was liberated by the Russians on September 7, 1945, after the A-bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war. The next part of the story is quite difficult to tell. The GIs were coming back from the prison camps and were scattered all over the Philippines, but mostly in Manila. My dad weighed 145 pounds when he was captured and only 75 pounds when he was freed. My mom set out to find him. She said she went from hospital to hospital, camp to camp, until one day she found him lying on a bed in a camp about 20 miles from her home. She nursed him back to health and soon they were on a ship back to the States. He and she survived all that war could deliver to come home and be my parents. My folks bought a 63-acre farm close to where my dad was born in Johnstown, and we lived there from 1955 until he died in 1964. He was only 55 years old. My mom, an immigrant from a faraway country who could barely speak English, was left to raise me. And as I look back on those years, my heart swells with pride and absolute admiration for them. My mom lived until 2001 long enough to see her son graduate from college and law school. She was there for the birth of my son, and she was front row center in 2000 when I was installed as president of the Bar Association of Montgomery County. In the fall of 1963, shortly before my father died, he made an appointment to see our local attorney in a little town a few miles from our house. I believe he knew he was ill and his time here was short. And like any good husband and father, he wanted to place his affairs in order. We went into the lawyer's office and were greeted by his secretary, who offered my mom and dad a cup of coffee and me a soft drink. I had never been in an office, and this office was filled with big leather chairs and big, heavy, darkly stained wooden desks. I remember sitting in his library and being surrounded by four huge walls covered with books. When the business was done, I asked my dad who the man was, and he said, he's a lawyer. And I said, what's a lawyer? And he replied, he helps people. And from that day forward, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. I believe that you can still honor your parents after they have passed away by living your life in a way that would make them proud, by treating all people with courtesy and respect, the way that I saw my mom and dad treat people, and by sharing their stories with others so that their lives may live on. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity this morning to honor my mom and dad. Since its founding in 1896, the MSBA has featured some very notable leaders. I am honored to stand here today on the shoulders of these outstanding predecessors. The Honorable James McSherry from Frederick was the Chief Judge of the Maryland Court of Appeals when he became our first president. Later in 1922, Albert C. Ritchie became president while serving his first term as Governor of the State of Maryland, a post he would hold until 1935. Ritchie twice ran for and twice failed to receive the Democratic nomination for the U.S. presidency. Many MSBA presidents have become federal judges, including W. Calvin Chestnut, Morris A. Soper, Rossell C. Thompson, Norman P. Ramsey, and Roger W. Titus. Many have also served as judges on our highest court, the Court of Appeals of Maryland, including James A. Pierce, Jr., John Peran Briscoe, Reuben Oppenheimer, Stedman Prescott, J. Dudley Diggs, and William J. McWilliams. Many of our presidents have also occupied seats on the circuit court bench around the state. H. Vernon Eney, MSBA president in 1963-64, went on to serve as president of the 1967 Maryland Constitutional Convention. Mr. Eney and his immediate successors, MSBA presidents J. DeWeese Carter of Denton and William L. Marbury, Jr., respectively, were the original three incorporators of the MSBA in March 1965. This dedication to serving the interests of MSBA members remains just as strong today. As the Honorable J. Michael Conroy, MSBA President in 2005-2006 noted, we will advocate for our members in every way we can to improve the quality and enjoyment of their practice of law. It is a never-ending task to be sure. As a Bar Association, we cannot rest on the good works that we have done noted Harry S. Johnson, MSBA's first African-American president. Rather, he said, we must continue to overcome obstacles and to measure our success by how well we serve our members. Likewise, the association's devotion to our justice system itself remains steadfast. We care about the rule of law, said President Edward J. Gillis. We will be the voice to protect an impartial judiciary and an independent legal profession. And we will continue to celebrate the importance of our profession in ensuring the freedoms of all. His successor, Allison Asty, stressed the importance of MSBA's role in preparing the next generation of lawyers. Our future as a society and as a profession, she said, depends upon the ability of today's young people to understand and respect the principles upon which our legal system was established. Looking forward, our immediate past president, Henry E. Dugan, reminded us of the importance of our legacy to society. Although our law business may demand of us a daily, realistic pragmatism, our law profession demands of us an idealistic philosophy of law, he stated. Without it, we are a ramshackle collection of empty suits signifying nothing. President Catherine Kelly Howard underscored her belief that each member of the MSBA has a real feeling that the law truly is a calling and that each of you, regardless of the type of practice you have chosen, has heeded the call to serve others through your knowledge of the law. The MSBA is the voice and the public face of Maryland lawyers, in the words of President Thomas C. Cardero. In its 117 years, our association has enjoyed a rich history led by many of the greatest lawyers, judges, and leaders in our state. As such, we have been blessed by the efforts and intelligence of these past leaders who have built such a strong foundation and organization which is highly regarded with respect 
and pride among both its members and the public. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my personal story with you and to do it in the manner in which I presented it here this morning. I want you to know that that presentation would not have been possible without the vision and the technical assistance provided to me by the following people. Patrick Tandy, Communications Director of the MSBA, Brian Nichols and Jason Zeisloff, also of the MSBA, Lawrence Hicks, Director of IT, uh, and our very own Executive Director, Director Paul Carlin. Please join with me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> if you recall, I opened my speech by telling you that the lead up to this moment caused me to engage in some soul searching and self-reflection and to ask questions like, do I have what it takes to lead this association? I introduced you to my parents, Irish and Lee, and I hope that the story that I told you of their lives has given you a sense of who I am as a person. I will probably never endure their hardships and nor ever make the same sacrifices that they did, but I hope that I have a little bit of their stock in me. I also presented a brief history of the association. I wanted you to meet and know some of the prior 118 men and women who have preceded me as president of this association. I have had the opportunity and the privilege to be the son of two amazing parents. And likewise, I've had the opportunity and privilege to follow in the footsteps and to be mentored by not only so many outstanding lawyers, but also so many outstanding people. In both instances with my parents and the past presidents, I stand before you today atop their shoulders. But for the sacrifices and love of my parents and the inspiration and mentorship of the past presidents, I would not be standing before you here today. I pledge to you that I will honor my parents and all of the past presidents by being diligent, resourceful, and responsive to the needs of the members of this association. One way I intend to do that will be by making the theme of my year civility, professionalism, courtesy, and respect. Our profession is scrutinized daily by the media and the public. We in this room, room know that lawyers are born do-gooders. We contribute thousands of hours and dollars to our profession and to those in the community who are in need. Unfortunately, the positive message of many is sometimes obscured by the negative acts of only a few. We can improve our image if we demonstrate to the public that we can be civil and respectful to each other, to judges, litigants, witnesses, and to the community that watches what we do. I intend to take my message of collegiality and mutual respect to as many members and as many forms of the association as my year will permit. I will have my first opportunity this Wednesday when I move the admission of candidates before the Court of Appeals. I would like to, thankfully, bring this annual meeting of the Maryland State Bar Association to a close by asking for one last indulgence. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce a few people who are my guests here today and to acknowledge and thank others for supporting me throughout the years. Let's begin with my wife, Andrea, and my son, John, sitting there in the front row. Please do. I want to thank them for allowing me the many hours and the many days from uh, being away from home to participate in bar activities. Then there is Mindy, my legal assistant. Please stand. <laughs> she, she is the chief cook and the bottle washer. She's the spiritual advisor, the confidant, the therapist, and above all, my best friend for the past 29 years. Mindy and I began working together in 1983. We celebrated the best and we endured the worst that life could offer in those years. From the early days of my practice when she used her paychecks to buy supplies for our office, to the great wins and to the sad losses that I experienced both inside and outside of court. We are affectionately known in our office as the Pickersons, 
<laughs> we have fired each other and rehired each other so many times. It is a unique friendship, to say the least. In fact, this is the very first speech that I have ever given or, ever, or I have ever written that she did not review and revise. <laughs> and I am sure I will hear about it. <laughs> Seated next to Mindy is her husband, Scott. Please, Mindy. <laughs> Mindy's and my friendship could not have endured for as long as it has without the mutual love and respect that Scott and I have for one another. He is such a special person, and he's been such a great friend to me for so many years. I am so happy and so glad that Scott and Mindy found each other. Uh, next uh, to my son, John, is my Aunt Rose. Rose Cadell, age 90. Oh, you don't have to get up, Aunt Rose. <laughs> she is the matriarch of the Cadell family. She's here all the way from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, Mineral Point. Um, and um, she, um, as I was growing up, um, my mom and Aunt Rose, of course, in the law, I suppose, were sisters-in-law. But Aunt Rose, I just want you to know that as far as my mom is concerned, you were always her sister. Next to uh, Aunt Rose is my cousin, well actually sitting next to Aunt Rose is Patty and my cousin Brian. My cousin Brian is the closest thing that I will ever have to a brother in this world. Brian. Um, I also want to introduce my partners, Terry McGann and Victor Del Pino. Terry? <laughs> Victor, and this must be the time of the year because Victor cannot be here because his wife is having a baby. <laughs> Maybe there's something in the water, I don't know. Uh, Victor and Terry have no idea what they've gotten themselves into, but I'm sure the ride will be fun for the next year. Now for some thank yous and acknowledgements. Uh, obviously, I want to thank my uh, friend, President Henry Dugan. Uh, I want to thank him one more time for mentoring me during the past year and for helping me. His steady hand and resolve has been an ins inspiration to me. Thank you, Henry. Likewise, I want to thank all of the past presidents who have reached out to offer words of wisdom and encouragement to me. I want to thank Paul Carlin, my Western Pennsylvania amigo. <laughs> 60 miles separate McKeesport from Johnstown. And Paul, uh, when I first met Paul, probably back, I guess, around 2000, we were instant friends. And my thought all along for the past 12 or 13 years has been, you can take the boys out of Pennsylvania, but you can never take Pennsylvania out of the boys. Thank you, Paul. Paul started taking me under his wing for, for this job uh, probably about a year ago, as is his custom, and the past presidents know this. Um, and I can assure you this, as long as Paul is our executive director, no president, including me, will stray too far off the course. I also want to thank Wanda Clayton. Each year, the annual meeting and the mid-year meeting just keeps getting better and better. Thank you very much, Wanda. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank Nicole Earl, the Director of Administration, Patrick Tandy, Director of Communications, Andrea Terry, Joanne Daniels, who run our CLE, Lawrence Hicks, who runs IT, Pat Yevix, uh, who is in charge of law office management, Richard Montgomery, who is the Director of our Legislative Relations Department, James Quinn, who's the Director of Lawyers Assistance, and all of the other Maryland State Bar employees who serve the needs of the membership. Please give them a round of applause. I would also like to offer a special thank you to Denise Williams, 
um, who each month ensures the smooth operation of the Board of Governors and the Executive Committee. Congratulations, Denise, thank you. And I also want to acknowledge someone who could not be here today, my friend of 32 years from across the pond, Steve Huxley, who will be watching this hopefully someday on YouTube. Hello, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank Chief Judge Bell and all of the Maryland judges for the collegiality and the friendship that we as lawyers of the bar share with our members of the judiciary. And thanks to the Bar Association, each and every one of you, for giving me this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to serve as your president. Thank you. I am ready for an exciting year. Unless there is an objection. Oh, wait. Barb Gillis. Yeah. It's an inside joke. You didn't think I would forget, did you? Unless there is any other objection. Or uh, I'm happy to bring this 117th annual meeting of the Maryland State Bar Association to adjournment, CNA Day. Thank you very much.